Good morning. Happy New Year. Before we uh, before we get into our topic today, just uh, you know, I'm always struck by uh, statistics at the New Year. According to the world population clock, there are now eight billion eight million six hundred seventy six thousand people alive in the world today. Uh, today, there's already been one hundred and seventy one thousand births and 86,000 deaths, according to this world population clock. And of course, these are approximations, but they're done based off of regression modeling. And um, and already since the uh, Greenwich Mean Time, since uh, what would be uh, 7 p.m. our time last night, 85,000 new people have been born into the world. So uh, um, uh, although, I guess those stats match up. Uh, anyway, just a little challenge to you as you think about the new year. Not real big on New Year's resolutions. They usually get broken by January 2nd. Um, but uh, I would encourage you to think about, uh, you know, things you do want to set out for the year. Uh, for lack of vision, my people perish is a, a verse of scripture. And you do want to think about what are the things you want to accomplish this year. And, um, you know, the uh, uh, the running joke is uh, you know, the woman writes to Santa Claus and she says, uh, dear Santa, uh, uh, this year I'd like my net wealth to grow and my weight to decrease. Mm -hmm. He got that wrong last year and um, uh, her net wealth decreased and her weight grew. Um, but uh, maybe instead of so focusing so much on things like that, um, focus on things that are a little more important, you know, uh, uh, a great challenge and something that you're really uh, called to do. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. So a uh, good resolution, good thing to, to aspire to is being in God's word every day. It's how he talks to you. Um, uh, this is how he talks to you. Uh, and it's stunning. If you, you, you're long in the tooth in the faith and you're going through different things in your life, uh, you begin to learn very quickly. You can be praying to the Lord one night about something you're going through. And the next day when you're reading your scripture, there's something that comes up in what you're reading that speaks to what you're going through. That's just not, a, that's not just hyperbole. That is true. Uh, so I'd encourage you to be in the word this year, spend some time every day in it. Uh, if you read four chapters a day, you'll generally get through the whole book at least read something every day uh, from scripture uh, and let the Lord use that in your life. Another thing I think would be a good thing to encourage you towards is um, that 8 billion figure. Uh, you know, uh, it would be a good thought if you could say, you know what, this year I'm going to try to share the gospel with a certain amount of number of people, you know, X amount of people or, um, or I'm going to pass tracks out and develop a habit to do that. Or I'm going to invite people to come to an event where they can hear God's word. Uh, the Lord is far more interested in that kind of activity than he is in what's going on in the White House right now. Uh, so just an encouragement to that regard. Um, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. And then we're going to talk about New Testament principles. And you're going to um, we'll talk about the series we're kicking off in the first few months of this year. And we're not going to do it every single time we get together, but we're going to be focused as a chapel on these things as to how we meet and why we meet the way we do. And we'll talk about that in a second. So let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he gave himself for this church. <clears throat> Father, we look at the New Testament and realize that it's essentially a series of little love letters written ultimately by the Holy Spirit to little local assemblies, Ephesus and Galatia and Rome. And, and even the Gospels were ultimately sent initially to some local church. We realize, Father, that you're concerned with the local church. So uh, we just pray for the eyes of understanding as we look on the pages of Scripture to understand how we are to meet as believers and the practices we are to engage in. Give us understanding, uh, Father, as we endeavor to follow the clear pattern of Scripture. And we just thank you for these things. Lift up our time to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So a couple of verses just to start our study off with. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we'll talk about this list in a second. 
1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. There are two things you ought to look to when you're deciding on what church you're going to attend, what local fellowship of believers you're going to attend. Um, Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. This, by the way, is called one of the pastoral epistles of Paul. Paul writes to Timothy and Titus, these two younger sons in the faith. He leaves Timothy in Ephesus. He leads Titus in Crete. They're um, protégés of his. He's discipling them. He's their mentor. And he tells them how the local fellowship ought to conduct themselves. And you see that right here in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So the first thing you ought to look at when you're deciding what local church you want to go to is do they follow the things that the apostles laid out as the things we ought to do and how we ought to conduct ourselves when we get together. Uh, first and second Timothy, Titus, but really the whole New Testament is filled with instructions and a pattern of how believers are supposed to conduct themselves when they get together, things they're supposed to do. So that's the first thing you ought to look for. Do they teach and do they follow the things that are taught clearly in the epistles in the New Testament? The second thing you ought to do, and this shows up in Romans 15, and we read this uh, recently here. I don't know if it was Brother Matthew who read this or, or uh, John Glock, but Romans 15, verse 4. Whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. Now, what am I getting at here? You see patterns begin to develop in the scripture, particularly in the book of Acts. You see them begin to do certain things. The early church conducts itself in a certain way. And we want to follow what they did. So not only do we want to follow uh, and obey the things that the apostles taught, but we also want to follow the pattern of the early church. So, for example, um, we this morning had a break in a bread. Some of you were here, some of you weren't, where we got together as a collection of believers and we remembered the Lord Jesus Christ and his person and his work. And we broke bread, drank the cup. Why do we do that on Sunday mornings? You know, what? there are plenty of fellowships that don't do it every Sunday. Why do we do it every Sunday? Because we're following the New Testament pattern. Let me show you this. Go to Acts chapter 20. In verse 7, Acts 20 and verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So already by the time of the book of Acts, by the time of Acts chapter 20, you see the pattern of the early church, the pattern of the disciples as they get together on the first day of the week and they break bread. That's their pattern. We want to follow that pattern. We want to follow the clear teachings of scripture and we want to follow that pattern. I'll tell you, it's not done. Following the pattern of the New Testament and just the pattern of the New Testament, and following the teachers of the New Testament, and just the teachings of the New Testament, is a rare thing. I remember the first time I came to uh, here, I'd been led to Christ uh, during the daily vacation Bible school that you all run every summer. A woman led me to Christ. She came out of the same background as I did, and uh, I was invited to come to uh, the chapel on Sunday morning after I had gotten saved over the summer. So I had no idea what to expect. I'd been here for daily vacation Bible school. I was 11 years of age and um, I knew her and I know the folks that were at daily vacation Bible school didn't know all these other people. I come in the back and there's Mrs. Citarella sitting. She's sitting right where Robert Lasota was at the time, which is interesting because usually she sat up here, but that day she was sitting in the back. She's waiting for me. 
She invited me to come. So I sat next to her and I had no idea what to expect. The tradition I came out of, which some of you have come out of, was that there's a guy who comes up with a big flowing robe. And he goes to the front and he starts to go through this orchestration, a very much orchestrated uh, set of events. I kept waiting for that to happen. It never happened. There's guys like him standing up and sharing a thought and calling out a prayer and, and giving out a hymn. And I, I'm just waiting. When does the real thing begin? And then all of a sudden, I realized this is the real thing. So what we're going to do as part of this series, and there's lots of topics to cover here, and some of you have been asked to pick up some of these topics. Some of you will be asked to pick up these topics. Um, but we're going to go through an overview of what the New Testament principles of gathering are. Um, and there are a number of them. We're also going to talk about um, why it is that we have uh, a plurality of leaders. Why is it that we have elders here versus a pastor? Many evangelical churches have a pastor, a singular man, or in some cases, woman, uh, a singular person who is kind of set up as the lead shepherd amongst the flock. Why don't we do that here? Why do we have multiple men and only men who serve in that capacity? We're going to go through that as part of this series. Um, why do we believe that the local church is autonomous. And you say, well, I have no idea what that means. Why is it that Bethany doesn't answer to a archdiocese or to some centralized organization in the state of New York or like the Catholic church does to the Vatican? Why don't we do that? Bethany Chapel has a philosophy based off of the principles of the scripture that we answer to one person alone, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Well, how can we justify that? You'll see as we go through scripture why we can justify that, that the local church is autonomous. You'll see as one assembly in the New Testament talks to another assembly in the New Testament, they never order them to do a thing. It's fascinating the dynamics that go on between the early uh, assemblies. Um, we're going to look at, and I think we're going to do this next week, the priesthood of all believers and the importance of your individual walk. Why is it that we don't have a one fella up here that's wearing garbs and we consider him our go between between the Lord and us? Well, the clear teaching of scripture is that you yourself are a priest. You yourself are a saint. You get this, by the way, in first Peter two, nine. Um, if you want to look there for a second. Incidentally, precursor next week, you're going to get a heavy dose of this. Uh, remember Brother Mathen, uh, he's been uh, he's going to take on the important task of demonstrating from the scripture and the, the ramifications of it, uh, the idea that we are priests. Uh, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This is first Peter two, nine, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Peter is not writing to a distinct set of clergy, by the way. You know who he's writing to? The saints, the collection of believers, all of them. He's writing to the men and the women. He's writing to the to the girls and the boys, all of whom. Um, the people he's writing to are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're considered in scripture to be saints, to be priests. I dare say the failure of the church to understand that is the primary thing that has given rise to the different denominations over the past 2000 years. Anyway, um, so we're going to go through that. We're going to go through spiritual gifts, big controversy last century, still some extent, but is uh, spiritual gifts and the use of spiritual gifts. Some spiritual gifts are no longer for today. You know that? Some spiritual gifts were confirmatory gifts at the time the gospel was first going out. But we know that in 1 Corinthians, Paul was saying some of these sign gifts are about to stop. There's an indication by the time 2 Corinthians come down that they had already stopped. We know from the book of Hebrews that they were done with by that point. We'll go through that as well. Um, we'll talk about the principal meetings of the local church. Ray has been tasked with uh, going through Acts 242. Everything this assembly does shows up in Acts 2.42. You consider those the four pillars of the church. And if you don't know what they are, he's going to teach them to you at the end of the month. 
um, but it's Acts 242. We believe in the principle of male leadership. Um, this is not to say that women don't have every quality and every capability that men do, but it is clearly taught in the scripture and it has been upheld by the sisters and the men who have been in attendance in this fellowship for the past 118 years, that there is a principle in scripture of male leadership. There is a principle in scripture that only men are to take the audible part in leading the worship of the assembly and in teaching the scripture. Boy, you want to talk about a doctrine that is not popular. That's it right there. Well, why do we believe that? Because it's in the scripture. It's what Paul clearly taught in the epistles. And we follow it. We're more interested in pleasing God than in pleasing men. Why did the sisters have their heads covered? I'll tell you something. Um, my wife and I were watching Heidi. I can't believe I watched Heidi, but um, Shirley Temple movie made in the 1930s. What is she, Swiss? I don't know what, she's Swiss? She's Swiss, right? They have a scene from the movie Heidi where she's going to the Dutch Reformed Church or whatever it is at the church that they go to. And she comes in the back and guess what's going on in the room? In this prayer service, every man has their head uncovered and every woman has her head covered, even Shirley Temple. And it's fascinating if you watch movies about Christmas time and church scenes from the 1930s and the 1940s and the 1950s, even the early 1960s. And you know what? It doesn't matter what the denomination was. Was it Catholic or Lutheran or Episcopalian or Anglican? Depictions of worship services, depictions of church gatherings. John Wayne in the movie The Searchers. They're gathering at a funeral and the girls have their heads covered and the boys have their hats off. Where does that come from? comes from the scripture, comes from 1 Corinthians. We're going to go through why we believe that is the case and what the significance is. So you sisters get to do something that John Jackson can't do. Not so well. You get to teach angels in a way that we never will be able to. So we're going to go through why we do that. We're going to go through the centrality of the Lord's Supper, why it is that the Lord's Supper is so important. You can make the case, I think, quite easily that one of the reasons why the assemblies, these collection of New Testament pattern meetings, have stayed away from doctrinal errors so well is because every Sunday morning we get back to basics. We get back to who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us. Um We'll talk about believers baptism. We've got two who've expressed an interest in being baptized uh, in recent days. We'll probably learn more about that even as part of that baptism if, if it goes forth. Uh, we're going to talk about commendation. Um, what does it mean to be commended to the Lord's work? We just lost a sister, Connie Giordano, who was commended by this gathering of believers back in 1948. Uh, she and her husband, Joe, were commended, and you heard John Jackson share what they were commended to. This assembly commended them to go into that work. What does it mean to commend someone? It's absolutely scriptural. You know that it's, uh, I'm, I'll let you know, so I'm on the board of CMML. Um, you know that it's been ex, uh, talked about at the board meeting of CMML that we may have commended more people to the Lord's work than any other assembly in the United States. Did you know that? We've commended um, more than two dozen people to the Lord's work in our 114 years. That's pretty amazing. What does it mean to commend someone to the Lord's work? What was Connie and Joe doing? And why did we commend them? We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, these are all principles of New Testament, how the New Testament church worked. We're going to talk about stewardship and tithing. We're going to talk about missions, why church planning is so important. Why is it that they're close to a thousand assemblies across the United States? How did they come to be? Well, you know what happened? One assembly planted another assembly. They saw believers coming from a particular area, and they started another work in that area. We just had one that started up south of the river here. Um, there's a hive off going in, in one of the meetings, and it's a friendly hive off. One of the meetings just across the river is started another meeting about an hour south of here. There's an explosion of assemblies going on in Manitoba right now. Mennonites are getting saved like crazy, and there's assembly work going on there. Um, so uh, how does that occur? We're going to talk about that as well. 
Great principle of the New Testament is living in light of the imminent return of Christ. Uh, you had to be struck by our brother this morning if you were listening um, during the breaking of bread when our when Norman shared the thought that at any moment the Lord Jesus Christ could return. I'll tell you one thing of it's for certain. We are closer today to the Lord's return than we were yesterday. Um, so we're going to talk about things like that. Personal evangelism, how to share the gospel concisely and what it means to disciple someone. These are all principles that show up in the New Testament, amongst other things. So we're going to go through that. Uh, during these um, uh, during these sessions, primarily on Sunday morning, occasionally on Tuesday night, we've got some decent brothers who will be uh, uh, sharing the word. We've got Keith Kaiser coming to participate. We've got uh, um, Victor Bonet coming. We've got uh, a few others and some of our own ranks. So, and you know why some of our own number are going to be preaching? Because we believe in the priesthood of all believers. So. I mean, let's start off with this first concept, which is um, why is it that we have elders and not a pastor, not a single pastor? Why do we have an elder? Why do we have elders? Why are they men? And why do we have more than one? And to do that, let's go to the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 14. Paul and Barnabas are on one of their early missionary journeys. By the way, Paul and Barnabas were commended to the Lord's work. Which assembly commended them to the Lord's work? Little assembly, just like Bethany Chapel 2,000 years ago, sitting in what country commended Paul and Barnabas to the Lord's work? It's Antioch. Antioch in Syria, modern-day Syria, commended these two to go off on a missionary journey. It's the start of uh, missions as we know it in a lot of ways. By the way, the reason we do missions and send people like Joan Levin good off to South Africa and countless others, we're following the New Testament pattern. Uh, so Acts 14.23, um, this comes on the heel of the heels of Paul and Barnabas having visited the city of Lystra and starting an assembly there, the city of Iconium, the city of Antioch, not Antioch in Syria, but Antioch in an area called Pisidia in Lyconia, which is modern day Turkey. Uh, they went to Cyprus. They also went to Perga. Um, but you see in Acts uh, 14, 23. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Um, so you see right off the bat, the early pattern of the church is that there is elders who are appointed in every church. It doesn't say an elder. It says elders. It's a plurality of leadership. By the way, you want a plurality of leadership. What do you do if one goes off the rails? What do you do if the pastor goes off the rails? The top fella in the, in the church goes off the rails. He comes up with some crazy, goofy doctrine, or he slips into immorality. The reason why the Lord set it up so that there was a plurality of leadership is so that if Rob Sullivan ever gets out of line, Norman and Ezekiel can handle it. It's brilliant. And it's a pattern throughout the New Testament. You're going to see at the end, uh, Paul is talking about the need to have elders with every fellowship. You see this in the book of Titus. Uh, Paul is writing to Titus years later. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Towards the end of Paul's ministry, for this reason, I left you in Crete. He's talking to Titus that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city, as I commanded you appoint elders in every church. Now, you have the apostles at the time, and they have the authority from God to appoint elders. We don't think that's the way it occurs anymore, especially as the pattern of the New Testament uh, develops. Um, well, we'll talk about who ultimately appoints elders just in just a minute, who do you think ultimately appoints elders according to the scripture? <laughs> Specific member of the Godhead who appoints elders. And you'll see. Uh, elders are given a number of titles in scripture. They're called elders, as we've already seen. Um, in uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, the word bishop is used for them. First Peter 5, uh, they're called overseers or pastors or shepherds. Um, uh, Let's go to Acts chapter 20, verse 17. We'll come back to 1 Peter 5 in a second. Uh, 
Paul's nearing the end of his uh, this missionary journey. He's getting ready to go down to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to be uh, put in jail for preaching the gospel. And he comes to Miletus, which is a port that's not too far from this bustling city of Ephesus. It's probably the third or fourth largest city in the world at the time. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders of the church. Again, you have this idea. It's a plurality from one local meeting. And he begins to talk to them about uh, things he is uh, uh, leaving in their stead. Um, so anyway, look at first Peter five. If you ask Ezekiel Montez, one of the elders in the chapel or Norman Luters, one of the elders in the chapel, how many years did they spend at seminary? They'll say a big fat whopping zero. If they've been in the word quite a bit. Um, watch this first Peter five, verse one. Again, Peter is writing to the local church. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I'm a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the, clerk, the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers and not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away term pastor or shepherd really is less of a title and more of a verb. But here's the thing I want you to focus on here. The elders who are among you, one of the things that we believe is a key New Testament principle is no distinction between clergy and laity. And by the way, that sets us apart from more than 90% of Christendom. Uh, if you're going to be a Catholic priest, you got to go through their seminary. You got to go through their rituals. You want to be a Baptist minister, except for the independent Baptists, you go to seminary. Lutheran preacher, um, we're reading these books, uh, the Mitford series, fascinating books, by the way. Um, if you've heard of the Mitford series, it's good fiction. It's about a, uh, I don't know what he is, Anglican, Episcopalian priest. Um, uh, interesting guy. But he was sent to a particular group to be their priest. That's not the New Testament pattern. The New Testament pattern is the eldership is to be from among the flock. They're already in fellowship in the flock. They're already doing the work of the elder, and they're recognized for doing that work. They're not somebody who's appointed to that work in our day. Um, so we don't believe, and we think it's a key thing, uh, that there is no distinction between the clergy and the laity. Uh, the people up here are preaching. They're also sitting in the fellowship. Doesn't mean we don't have visiting speakers, but they're from among the flock. Um, again, the failure of the church to understand this, that there needs to be a distinctive class more than any other reason, is the, it provide, explains why it is that we have the different denominations in the world today. So let me tell you a little story. Um, I am a Civil War buff. You know, I, I've got everything going on in my family. Uh, you, if you've heard me speak in around Thanksgiving time, you know that my great, great, great grandfather uh, fought for the Irish Brigade from New York, fighting 69th. And he fought for the North on my father's side, not on my mother's side. On my mother's side, and her ancestors come out of uh, Arkansas and uh, North Carolina, my great, great, great grandfather on my mother's side fought for North Carolina. You know, we can trace them to be on the same battlefield at Gettysburg at the exact same time. Um, although we don't think they were shooting right across from each other. Uh, I'm glad they weren't good shots or I wouldn't be here. Um, one of the neat stories that comes out of the Civil War is the day that Robert E. Lee surrendered. You know, within a few days, Abraham Lincoln is going to be assassinated. Um, but it's a documented story. It's fascinating to read this from biographers. Um, but one of the uh, Confederate Civil War veterans who had been prisoner at a POW camp in uh, Virginia was released by the Union Army um, because he was uh, really, he was older, 
much older, and he wasn't viewed to be that much of a threat. And he uh, decided he wanted to go see President Lincoln. He was concerned about the state of his home, and he wanted a pass to get through the Union lines to get back to his home in Virginia, which is just across the Potomac. So he went up to the White House. He was in a prisoner of war camp in Washington, D.C. The war had just ended. The Union Army started to release the older fellows that day. And as he's walking across to go to the White House, uh, what do you think these Union soldiers are going to do with a guy who's wearing a Confederate uniform, a tattered Confederate uniform, walking up to the White House? What do you think they're going to do? So he goes to approach the White House. He's met by the security detail, which, by the way, would have been good if they were doing their job the next day at, uh, at Ford Theater, right, where John Wilkes Booth got him. But they're doing their job that day. And as he comes up to go to the entrance, uh, he's rebuffed. He's rebuffed by some big old Union soldiers. In fact, when he comes back a second and a third time, they decide to get a little rough with him. And they uh, rough him up and throw him across the street and say, don't come back. So the man is destitute. He is just crying. He's beside himself in the street there as the horse wagons are going by. And all of a sudden, this little boy comes up to him. This little boy comes up to him, 12-year-old boy. 12-year-old boy's got a cleft palate. He stutters. 12-year-old boy comes up to him and says, uh, sir, what's wrong? And the soldier begins to tell him this story, that he can't get in to see the president. He needs to get a pass to get through the Union lines to get down to Virginia. So the boy says to him, come with me. 12-year-old boy. He just turned 12 that day. So this little boy named Tad walks him across the street and he starts to walk up the, the path to the White House. All of a sudden, these Union soldiers are watching it and they come to attention. The little boy takes the Confederate soldier by his hand, walks right by the guards, and the guards don't say a word. He walks up to the front door. He opens the door. He pushes the door open. He goes walking past the secretary, a woman by the name of Kennedy. He goes right past her, goes right up to the door of the Oval Office, or what would be the Oval Office. He opens the door up, and there's Abraham Lincoln, and he says, Tad, come on in. It's his son. Sure enough, he got his pass. We as believers have been given a relationship with God the Father, the highest sovereign in the land. We don't need a clergy to go through. We're priests ourselves. We're wearing that Confederate garb, but we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the Son has given us access to the throne room of God. So that's why we don't believe in a clergy laity distinction. Each one of you is a priest before God. So other things related to this, our time is going. Acts 20, verse 28. This is that same scene where Paul, he's getting they're ready to go down to Jerusalem. He's fairly certain he's never going to see these saints from Ephesus, which he had a heavy hand in building up the local fellowship there. Um, he calls for these elders to come meet with him at Miletus. It's a sad scene in Scripture. It's an important scene in Scripture. And then Paul gives them this charge. Verse 25, indeed, now I know that you all among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Paul knows he's never going to see these elders again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I've not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. You know what Paul's saying to them? I've taught you everything I know. The job is now yours. Take care of that flock. You several guys from this one local fellowship, you take care of that flock. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. In other words, watch your own walk and watch the walk of the flock. Among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. By the way, a great verse on the deity of Christ. Because Acts 20 uh, 28 tells you right there that God shed his own blood to purchase the church. Well, who shed his blood to purchase the church? 
Lord Jesus Christ. Great verse for the deity of Christ. Anyway, according to what Paul says here, who has made these fellas the elders of that local church? Holy Spirit. If you get your authority bestowed upon you by the highest authority there is, you don't have to go to anyone else other than him. And the reason I bring this up is another principle that we follow here is the principle of the autonomy of this local church. Bethany Chapel does not answer to Tenafly. Bethany Chapel does not answer to Sacred Heart uh, Parish over here. Bethany Chapel answers to the Lord and to this book. So I'll tell you another story. Not only am I a Civil War buff, I'm a World War II buff. And, uh, you know, uh, Mary Liz's brother, uh, Billy, he and I would, we were fascinated by World War II. Uh, his dad was in the Navy, uh, more Korea. Um, I don't know if he saw much action. Um, the sort of the end of World War II, PT boats, um, you know, same uh, same type of ships that John F. Kennedy was on. Uh, my father was a tanker. He worked for, uh, he was in George Patton's Third Army, saw lots of action in, in the uh, European theater. Um, one of the interesting stories that comes out of World War II is in the Pacific. Uh, first six months of the war, if you don't know this, the United States was losing the war. The uh, United States basically lost every single engagement going up against the Japanese um, till June of 1942. We lost to Pearl Harbor. We lost the Philippines. We lost Wake Island. Uh, uh, the British are losing Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, the Allies are getting the dog beat out of them. Uh, the U.S. is down to three aircraft carriers, one of which was almost blown out of the sea at a place called Coral Sea. Japanese are sending 200 ships, six aircraft carriers, and hundreds of thousands of men to attack the Aleutian Islands in Alaska and this key little island in the middle of the Pacific called Midway. And against that, the United States has three aircraft carriers, about 20 support ships, and a bunch of Marines on Midway Island. And Washington, D.C. is very nervous because they know the U.S. has to build up getting ready to fight the Germans and the Japanese. It's going to take us a few months to get our factories pumping these aircraft carriers out and these airplanes out. And all we've got is left is three aircraft carriers in the whole world. So an admiral by the name of Nimitz decides he's going to gamble everything and put these three aircraft carriers up at Midway and try to catch the Japanese by surprise. Now, a little thing you need to know about Nimitz. Nimitz had replaced uh, Admiral Kimmel as the head of the Pacific Fleet. You don't know who Kimmel is, but he was the guy in charge of Pearl Harbor the day at Pearl Harbor was attacked. So he got removed from command. Nimitz was jumped over 50 admirals, and he was made the head of the Pacific Fleet by the President of the United States. So when uh, Nimitz decides to gamble the entire aircraft carrier fleet at Midway, his advisors came to him, and you know what they said? Don't you think you ought to check with someone before you do this? You can lose this. That's it. We lose the war. You know what he said? No. I was given my job by the president of the United States. I don't need to check with anybody. There's nobody between me and him. He gave me the job. We're going to send the ships out there. And if you know your history, what happened in Midway? Japanese lost badly. They lost four aircraft carriers. They lost hundreds of thousands of men. Well, 20,000 uh, 20, 20, sailors. We lost one ship. One ship. And a destroyer. The Japanese never won a battle for the rest of the war. And we won every single battle for us. What I'm getting at is this, though. The reason we believe in the autonomy of the local fellowship, why Yonkers Assembly doesn't answer to another assembly somewhere, doesn't answer to another church group somewhere, is because we've been given our authority by the Holy Spirit himself. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. What a heavy responsibility that is. Do you know the scripture teaches that the elders of this fellowship will give an account for your souls to the Lord Jesus Christ? We have to give an account, which is why we're dogged in defending the fellowship. Anyway, um, so... And that autonomy allows for a lot of gray areas to be addressed. I was eavesdropping on a conversation. You want to do something neat. Listen to conversations between old men. <laughs> no, between older brothers. He's a young brother. But brothers who are very mature in the faith or sisters who are very mature in the faith. I was eavesdropping on a conversation between Jacob Mathen and Norman Luters during the 
he's like, what in the world are you about to say right now? And they were talking about an issue that was going on, I believe in India over one cup versus many cups. You know that um, when we break bread, we have little, many little plastic cups, right? If you go back 40 or 50 years ago, most assemblies had one cup. Everybody drank out of the same cup. Does that sound like a good idea to you? At some point, and I don't know when it occurred here, I've seen it occur at a number of assemblies around the country. The elders made the decision, maybe it's better for hygiene's purposes to go to many little cups versus one cup. Um, did they check with anyone? Oh, they just made the decision. We had a crisis on our hands two years ago, right? COVID is breaking out. Do we get everybody together when we don't even know what this thing is? Or do we hold off for a bit and start to just meet on Zoom? So the elders got together. We had a conversation, Norman, Ezekiel, Mike, and myself at the time. And we said, what are we going to do? We just made a call. Now, we didn't make an uninformed call. We actually got advice and counsel. We called up. John Reimer, who's a, a physician in one of the Augusta meetings. We called up Steve Price, who's a physician in the Kansas meeting. Called up Chuck Anderson, who's a physician in the North York, Pennsylvania meeting. By the way, each one of those fellows is an el elders or elders. They're physicians. We asked them for their advice. We followed their advice. By the way, do you know that when we asked John Reimer, a physician, by the way, he had the best rate, success rate in the state of Georgia at keeping people in his nursing home alive when COVID first broke out. He was fabulously successful. He developed techn techniques that Georgia started to use because he 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 really uh, um, just watched what was working and what wasn't working. But you know what John Reimer said when we asked him, as I was on the call, Chuck Henderson said when I asked him, and Steve Price said when, he, when we asked him, what do you think we ought to do? Should we have a meeting this Sunday when COVID break out or not? Each one of them said, well, here's what we're thinking of, do, of doing. Here's what we're thinking of doing. You may want to consider that. You may want to think about this. You may want to do that. You know what not one of them said to us, though, was you need to do this. You must do this. And you know why they wouldn't say that? Because of the autonomy of the local church. And by the way, that's biblical. Let me show you something in the book of Acts. This is fascinating to me. Watch. Um, uh, Acts 15. Let's go to Acts 15. Let's do Acts 14 instead. Acts 14, verse uh, 26. From there, they sailed to Antioch. This is Paul and Barnabas and their little crew, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks' commendation. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Now, watch this. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So here are these men that come to the Antioch church up in Syria, and they say, hey, guess what? You think this justification by faith thing is enough to be saved? It's not. You also have to be circumcised. If start keeping some of the law. If you don't do that, you're not saved. These people are what we call Judaizers. They're men who still want to hold on to the law, and they reject the idea of the gospel, that you're saved by faith through grace alone. They reject it. And Paul and Barnabas have a cow. And rightly so. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and, and dissension and dispute with them, look at what the Antioch assembly does. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So the Antioch assembly, their elders says, we've got this idea that's come out of Judea, come out of Jerusalem. And they're saying, we got to be circumcised to be saved. Let's go get advice from Judea, where this whole idea comes from. So they send Paul and Barnabas, and not just Paul and Barnabas, others. And they say, you go to Jerusalem, you ask that assembly, do we need to be circumcised to be saved? Do we need to follow the law? So the one assembly is asking for counsel from the other assembly. And this is another principle that's a New Testament principle. Local New Testament pattern fellowships can have 
fellowship with one another. We can do meetings together. We can ask advice of one another. We can have conferences together and start Bible camps together and start Bible colleges together. Because the pattern of the New Testament church wasn't just that each assembly was an island unto itself, but they, they had fellowship and communion and work with the other meetings. So Antioch says, this crazy idea, we think it's crazy, but maybe it's not, came out of Jerusalem. Let's ask the Jerusalem brethren about it. So they send a message to Jerusalem, help us. Now watch what Jerusalem does. To me, this is one of the most profound passages on ecclesiology, the study of the church in Scripture. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Now watch this. When they'd come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So this same problem that was brought to Antioch by fellows from the Jerusalem assembly, they're now whooping it up in Jerusalem itself. Antioch wants help from Jerusalem. What do you think we ought to do? Watch what Jerusalem does. Go down to verse 22. A whole council has gotten together where the apostles, the elders, they talk about what would God have us do? Are we supposed to keep the law? And clearly the teaching of the gospel is we're not to keep the law. Those things of the Old Testament were symbols were pointing towards the coming of Christ, but they're no longer needed. And they're for Israel, by the way, not for the church. So look at verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to the Antioch assembly, along with Paul and Barnabas. Namely, they sent Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Now watch what they say to the Antioch assembly. They wrote this letter by them. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. What do the next three words say? Next four words. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Paul and Barnabas, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these things, that you abstain things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. You understand you could not get a softer term in the New Testament than it seems good to us. They are so careful not to order Antioch to do certain things. They just make a recommendation. Now, the clear teaching in the New Testament is we don't have to keep the law. In fact, it's additive and it's, it's detrimental. But the one assembly as it counsels the other assembly is so aware of the autonomy of the local church, they just offer advice. It's why we believe in the autonomy of the local church. And um, these are good things to know. It's also why, and I want to wrap up with a couple things here. The local church is so important in God's economy of things. But it's not Norman Luter's, Ezekiel Montez's, or Bobby Sullivan's local church. You know whose local church it is? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's yours. He owns it, but it's your meeting. The responsibility for the fellowship falls to all of us. Falls to all of us. We had, there's an assembly down in North Carolina. In fact, it's uh, one that uh, our brother Rigo went down to. And they had a fella uh, come from an, a meeting in El Salvador, another assembly in El Salvador, where the guy brought some strange teachings and some strange practices to their attention. You know what the elders in that assembly did? They sent a letter to this meeting down in El Salvador and said, what in the world is this all about? You know what the elders in the El Salvador meeting said? Get rid of this fellow. We've thrown him out of our meeting. He's not from us. They advised. They warned. Actually, what they said was, uh, to quote uh, an elder in that meeting, their letter says, it seems good to us. 
<laughs> that you put this guy out. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing, which I think was interesting. Anyway, um, there's more we could say. I want to finish with this. Go to the last slide. Uh, And we're running a little late here. Um, these are the qualifications for being an elder in the Bible. Uh, Paul writes the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. This is from the Amplified Bible. I'm just going to read it to you, um, which is, you know, basically it's taking the text of the scripture and then it's amplifying it for the sake of elucidating and, and understanding. Um, according to Paul, Here's what the qualifications for an elder should be. This is a faithful and trustworthy saying. Paul writes to Timothy. If any man eagerly seeks the office of an elder or an overseer or a bishop or a superintendent, he desires an excellent task. Now look at the qualifications for an elder. He must be blameless and beyond reproach. The husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not a bully nor quick-tempered and hot-headed, but gentle and considerate, free from love of money, not greedy for wealth and its inherent power, financially ethical. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity, keeping them respectful and well-behaved. For a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? He must not be a new convert so that he will not behave foolishly and become conceited by the appointment to this high office and fall into the same condemnation incurred by the devil for his arrogance and pride. And he must have a good reputation, be well thought of by those outside of the church so that he will not be discredited and fall into the devil's trap. Uh, Joni Erickson Tata, she said, ladies, you want a good list for a, a checklist for the type of guy you're looking for? That's it. By the way, this is something every believer should aspire towards. Every one of these qualifications is really an expectation of every single believer. But your elders must have these qualifications. He also says to Titus, for this reason, I left you behind in Crete so that you would set right what remains unfinished and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, namely a man of unquestionable integrity. It doesn't say a woman. It's a distinctly male term that's used there in the Greek. It follows the principle of male leadership. The easy thing for us to do today, easy thing for us to do today would be to go with the flow. We live in a culture that is very much um, been feminized. Very much use the world through the prisms of a, a, a leftist philosophy of the difference between men and women. There's no doubt horrible abuses have occurred over the history of the world as it relates to women. No doubt. The funny thing is, the world rejects Christianity. They don't understand that the greatest force for good in liberating women was actually the gospel. But the clear teaching of the Holy Spirit, and he's the sovereign of the universe, is that male leadership is what the expectation is and is what needs to be the case. So um, for this reason, I left you behind in Crete. So, uh, 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 I left you behind in Crete so that you would set right what remains unfinished and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, namely a man of unquestionable integrity, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of being immoral or rebellious. For the elder or overseer as God's steward must be blameless, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not violent, not greedy for dishonest gain, but financially ethical. And he must be hospitable to believers as well as strangers, a lover of what is good, sensible, fair, devout, self-disciplined, above reproach, whether in public or in private. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy word of God as it was taught to him so that he will be able to give accurate instruction and sound, reliable, error-free doctrine and to refute those who contradict it by explaining their error. It's the amplified version, but I think it does a pretty good job of laying out the ideas laid out there in the pastoral epistles. Anyway. It's going to be an interesting series. And, uh, you know, our desire is to obey Christ and to follow the pattern that was set forth. So last thought is um, you're all wearing Confederate garb. You're clothed in uh, bodies of sin. And there's a tough angelic task force and your sins have separated you from God. But there's one 
who can get you into the Oval Office, the King's son. The only way you can get in, though, the only way you can get in to see the king, have your garb changed, and get that pass through the lines, is by putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that you know, I'm a sinner and I deserve to be separated from all of eternity. But I don't want to be separated from him all, for all eternity. It's this crazy idea to, out there that uh, you want to go to hell because that's where all the partiers are going. What they don't understand is this teaching of scripture is every good thing comes from God. Joy and happiness and pleasure. Every good thing comes from God. And when you're separated from him for all of eternity, all that's gone. But you can get in to see and have that relationship with God the Father because of God the Son, if you put your trust in him. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. And thank you for the extra 10 minutes. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful teaching of Scripture about how the New Testament pattern church ought to meet. Father, we want to endeavor at Bethany Chapel as a flock, not just the elders, but as a collective flock here to follow the New Testament pattern. It's not left to guesswork as to how we ought to meet. It's right there laid out in the pattern of the book of Acts and the pattern of the epistles. It's right there laid out, Father, in the things we ought to do and what Paul has said in those epistles and what the apostles have said in those epistles, how we ought to conduct ourselves in the gathering of the local body. Father, we thank you for this chapel. We thank you for how you've raised it up. You raised up men and women to found this fellowship as led by the Holy Spirit back in 1904. And you've been using it in the lives of the saints ever since. So, Father, we just pray that we would uh, um, have the same heart towards the local fellowship that you clearly do. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.